Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Brother Johnny uh, left a lot of uh, indelible marks uh, here with us. And one of the things he always said is, uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all say that together, okay? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all stand and sing number 104, Amazing Grace. Bible, 
we, we need to see people saved. Father, if we come before that throne of grace this morning, we understand and know that our nation needs a great revival. And Lord, I pray that we might see the results in our tent revival. We're thankful for the opportunity to give us from day to day that we might speak to those about us that do not know you as a person Savior. Lord, I pray for our children today. It troubles me when I think of the society that they may have to grow up in. Lord, I just pray for the coming presidential election that you might intervene and that our nation might remain a Christian nation. I just pray for those of us today in a new community that's building that we might reach out to them. And these things we ask in thy name. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. You know, October uh, will be a year last year at the Tent Crusade that our men started a new tradition in this church. And I hope it's one that carries on. And, and Brother Norris brought up the, the bringing up the children that I hope our young men follow suit. And that's praying over the, the speaker. Uh, we started it out at the Tent Revival. We started a study in November, Waking the Sleeping Giant. And it called us out to be leaders. And the, proud, the thing that makes me proud is one of our men said, spoke up and said, why don't we do it every Sunday? So we started it. And I just asked the question, have you seen any results or any differences in our church in the last year? I mean, it's, it's powerful. Now, the cool thing about it is that I didn't even get with Brother Mike for numbers. But I know through, I think, March, April, we had baptized more people than we did in that short of January... <laughs> Mark or April, we had baptized more people than the previous year. Is it working? I believe so. Well, two weeks we're going to begin a new study. It's a follow-up, one of the follow-ups for Waking the Sleeping Giants. And guys, if you've never been in men's ministry, you're curious, we're going to meet today at 3.30. We have a guest speaker. Uh, and if the Lord would have it, his testimony goes right along with our upcoming study. So I just want to take a moment to invite you. We'd love to have you. Uh, just come see what it's about if you've not been a part of it. Yeah. Right, very good. And welcome again. Good morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, if you would, there's a portion of your bulletin. If you would fill it out and hand it in after the service in the back, there's a table and you get a, a nice mug. We started to uh, give those out to our first time visitors. Um, a few announcements for you um, coming up um, our, is our Fall Fest, October 26th. Uh, on a Saturday afternoon, we will have our Fall Fest. Um, you can see that there are a few things that we help with. Uh, the first thing, we're asking about a planning meeting. We're going to have to reschedule that. Uh, we won't be able to do that after services next week. Uh, I'll get with you on a, on a new date. Uh, but we are doing a candy drive for that. And we're going to do it differently this year, so instead of everybody just coming and bringing a bag of candy, uh, it's going to be Sunday school classes versus each other. And so the Sunday school classes that bring the most pounds of candy per person uh, will win a lunch served by the youth. Unless the youth win, and then we're just going to have pizza. And so uh, <laughs> we'll enjoy that. Or you can all pizza with us. No. Uh, but uh, so please uh, be engaged in that. Um, obviously, the more candy you bring, the less uh, we have to worry about, and you know, the more we can treat. Um, but also, uh, we're asking for some volunteers to uh, bring their cars and open up their trunks and hand out candy from there. Now, we're also asking you to decorate and make sure that you are uh, manning your vehicle because. Um, if it's just sitting there, that might, that might be a problem. Um, and uh, I've had a couple thoughts, well, what about trucks? Um, truck beds work better than, truck, than trunks do, so you can do all kinds of stuff with, it, with a truck bed. And so uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, and so that, again, it's coming up October 26th, and, um, and so make sure you're participating in that. Um, some other things, uh, the Sunshine Seniors are still taking uh, orders for their shirts. Um, if you have questions, ask Joy, uh, if you can, about that. 
Um, also, if you would like to serve as a messenger for our um, upcoming Central Baptist Association meeting on October 17th, let Brother Mike know and he can give you all those details. Um, also, uh, as Norris has said, um, our 10th Crusade is coming up. We need to be in prayer for that. Uh, after September 29th or October the 2nd is our crusade. Um, this Thursday at Ron Shelby's we'll have our final prayer gathering. And then it'll be here. It's, it's going to be here very quickly. Um, a few things with that. So if you would like to be in the choir uh, this afternoon at 4.30, uh, you will be meeting with the, uh, the worship leader for our 10th crusade, Larry Grace, and it'll be here uh, to lead that. You can see the other stuff going on with the choir. Uh, but also, uh, we will be providing child care for the tent crusade. Um, and if you would like to help in that, there's a sign up in the back. You can talk to Kathy about that. Um, but again, if you, you need child care, so that's a blessing that we are able to provide that. And so, um, uh, but we have one final video for our upcoming women's retreat. To go on vacation? Perhaps a trip around the world. And even better, wishing you could take some friends? Well, we've got just the trip for you. We're taking you on a trip around the world. You'll travel to Australia. Let's go on a walkabout. Look, I hope we see a kangaroo. Then swing across the pond to Europe! I feel the culture soaking in already. Do you think I can learn to play the bagpipes while we're here? Then join the bustling crowds in Asia. Whoa, you're really getting into this. Thank you. This makes me hungry for noodles. Next, track to the bottom of the world, Antarctica. I'm freezing. Hey, I'm going to go march with those penguins over there. From there, travel on to South America. Hey, let's go to the Marvelous City. Well, first we need some coffee. Take a safari in Africa. <laughs> safari! And finally, journey to North America. Hola! Howdy! Hockey, eh? Batter up! going on a wonderful world retreat. Want to go with us? Yes! Wonderful world! Come explore God's love and wonder! Well, listen, let me just remind you again. I want to let you hear and see a little bit about what this offering goes to. Thank you for those who've given. We're about a third of the way or just over a third of the way toward our goal. It's not too late. They're offering envelopes in your bulletin. But watch this video to hear and to see what, what this offering goes toward in our state and what we do. Joshua Mayfield. I am the administrator of chaplaincy services for the Arkansas Department of Corrections. I work out of central office in Pine Bluff, but we have prisons all over the state, and I, I supervise chaplaincy at those prisons. The demographics in the Arkansas prison system are the same as they are in the state of Arkansas. We have 17,000 plus inmates today in the custody of Arkansas Department of Corrections. I have 24 full-time state paid chaplains, so that's intimidating math. I believe that God loves 
the inmate who's being processed in today and who's still got drugs in his system, I believe that God actually loves that inmate as much as he does me or my wife or my child. I'm incredibly grateful that the Arkansas Baptist Convention chooses to dedicate a portion of the Dixie Jackson offering uh, to prison work. What Dixie Jackson money has allowed us to do over the years is to provide top flight training for our chaplains and our volunteers. What we've been through so far this morning is uh, steps to get into the jail ministry and how to go about um, being effective in the jail ministry and also do's and don'ts. And just basically that sense of hope that's lost with a lot of the people that are in jail and, and bringing that hope to them and, and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's, that's ultimately what I think has been real touching. It is no exaggeration to say that those materials have resulted in changed lives both in the prison and outside the prison. So Dixie Jackson makes a very real, very visible, very tangible difference in what we are able to do on a day-in, day-out basis. We are opening a seminary program for inmates at Barner. The College of Mid-America uh, at Barner is going to hold classes this fall. And for those who don't know, Barner is our supermax prison in Arkansas. It's the hardest prison that we have in a lot of ways. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in professors from Mid-America Seminary in Memphis. And they are going to teach inmates about the Word of God. We are identifying inmates who are doing a long time. They're going to be here a while. And they have a desire to learn about the Word of God. And we're going to equip them for ministry. And they're going to act as missionaries within the prison setting in Arkansas. We didn't invent this concept. We have seen what it has done in other states like Louisiana and Texas. And we need that here. What we are praying for in Arkansas, what we hope to see in Arkansas, is that the atmosphere of a prison will become a place where it is normal for men to be seeking after God. It is normal for men to be edifying to one another in their conversation and their conduct. And it is normal for them to take care of one another, have compassion on one another. And I can tell you that they're talking about starting seminary classes and allowing inmates to get college degrees. That's not just something that, that has begun this spring. And we have classes ongoing in the seminaries, like he said, to equip inmates to be able to live out their faith and become missionaries within the population. Did you hear what he said? How many inmates are in jail, in prison, in Arkansas? I'm not talking about local detention centers. I'm talking about state prison system. Half the population of this city. If you want to visualize it, that's how many are in prison. Through our giving, for our support of this, we have an opportunity to help carry the gospel. Let's pray God will lead us in what we ought to do. Father God, again, thank you. Thank you that we get to be a part of impacting this state. And people within our state, we may never meet directly except this side of glory, God. We pray that you would continue to touch our heart. And Father, help us to give generously to support this work and this effort that your name can be glorified. Thank you for this new ministry that's begun in Harvard. God, we pray your blessing on it. And those who help lead and equip, call out from within the population in the prison. God, those who would be serious about seeking you and serving you and representing you in order. And God, I pray that would spread across this state also. Lord, we praise you and thank you that we can ask these things. We thank you for your blessing. We pray your continued blessing in Jesus' name. In just a, a little bit, we're going to be uh, celebrating the uh, Lord's Supper.
And uh, as we prepare for that, let's all stand and sing.
talked about preparing for our upcoming 10th crusade. I've shared with you about some things that that need to happen in our lives, in our families, in our church in these days. I've shared about the need for unity within the church as we come together in these days. I've shared about that we need to get serious. Remember we talked about Isaiah and how God gave him a fresh vision of his holiness. How he got serious about sin in his life and about his commitment to serving God. <coughs> Last week we shared about how we need God to help us to see more clearly his will for our lives. This morning, I want to share with you about our need to be prepared. Now, not so much physically. Now, there are things we need to do physically to prepare and to get ready. But especially this morning, I, I want you to think with me about spiritual <coughs> preparation. And I want to just share with you that we need to prepare for war. Because if we are serious 
about wanting to see God work in these days, you can count on it. Satan is going to work in opposition to it. On the back of your bulletin, I put a little statement. Spiritual activity begets spiritual activity. And if we're, if, if we're serious about saying, Lord, we are praying, we are asking You to do a greater work in our lives and in this church and in this community than You have ever done before. If we're serious about praying that and believing God for it, guess what? You can expect Satan to countermand that. And he will work in greater ways, perhaps, than he has ever worked before. And we need to prepare for that attack. So, just so that you're clear, what I'm talking about is we get started this morning. I want to share with you some of the more obvious ways that, that I've seen and the Scripture would affirm that Satan is going to attack. You might want to make note of these. The first of those is he'll try to get us to doubt. You remember that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You remember when Satan came up to Eve and the forbidden fruit on the forbidden tree? And he says, you know, God told us not to eat that. For in the day we eat it, we will die. Satan comes along and he says, did God really say that? I mean, that's what he did from the very start. I can just tell you, he wants to get you and I to doubt. Is it really true? Do you know why doubting Thomas was not present when the disciples gathered together immediately after the resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ? He didn't expect Jesus to be there. <coughs> And I can just tell you, there are some that, that already, when we start talking about setting up a tent and doing some things different, and how do we get from here to there, and how does all this work, and we can begin to come up with all kinds of reasons and things, but is this really going to work? Is this really what we all... And, and, and I can just tell you, people begin to doubt. And I can just tell you, Satan likes it when we begin to doubt. And when, when we begin to question, can God really do this? Can God really use Trinity Baptist to impact this community? Can He do that? You know what the Bible says in Romans, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I can just tell you one of the ways Satan will attack is causing you to doubt whether or not it's really worth the effort. Because I can just tell you, coming and being here during a tent crusade, it takes extra effort. Some of you are going to work all day, and it's like, is it really worth it? Let me just tell you, if Thomas had known Jesus was going to show up, you couldn't have kept him away. But he'll work through doubt. Another way that Satan will try to work is through division. Through trying to cause conflict in the home, family, even within the church. Let me tell you, today everything may be going well in your life, your family, and in our church. But when you and I get serious about seeking the Lord, let me just tell you, that's when conflicts arise. That's when Satan starts to work. As long as you and I are going the way he wants us to do, he'll leave us alone. But when we get serious about serving Him, as these men in the study have learned this last time, we become a hard target for Satan. And he will go after us. You know, I've shared with you before, in my home and in my family, Kathy's not here to tell you about it, but I can just tell you there are times when I have gotten up on Sunday morning trying to get ready to preach and I will have to call home to apologize to my wife before I can preach on Sunday morning. And I've told God that's not fair. <laughs> she doesn't have that same pressure. But I can just tell you it's very seldom her fault. It's, it's my fault. <laughs> I will own up to that and I will just tell you that's the way it is. 
But whenever you and I get serious, when we say, God, we want to see you do a larger work than you've ever done before, that's when He'll start stirring up conflict and division, even within the church. That's when I will have people come as your pastor and they will complain about all kinds of different... And I sometimes go, where is all this coming from? But I just tell you, I've learned that when, when, the, when the complaints or the issues start piling up or people start getting crossways over little stuff, I go, okay, God, you're up to something. You're at work and you're moving. One of the questions I have learned to ask myself periodically when I'm dealing with conflict and issues that come up is I go, of what eternal significance is this? And there are a lot of things that I can get uptight about and you can get uptight about, and yet when you look at them from the perspective of eternity, guess what? All of a sudden, well, that's not that big of a deal anymore. Again, I will tell you, when it comes to getting ready for our tent crusade, I've said we need to come together as God's people and be united. How good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The Bible says we're not to seek our own good, but the good of others. And that means we get our focus off of ourselves and our selfishness and on Him. But I tell you, if doubt and distraction don't, if, if doubt and division don't work, let me tell you, another thing he'll use is distraction. Distraction. And let me just tell you, distraction in my life is not normally to do that which is evil. It's to do that which is good that keeps me from doing that which is best. And he will distract you from what you really need to be doing. In my life, I can just tell you, you know what keeps me from praying like I need to and studying God's Word like I need to? Busyness. I get busy. I'm your pastor. I'm busy all the time. But let me just tell you, if I get too busy to pray, if I get too busy to read God's Word, I'm busier than God wants me to be. And that's true in your life and in my life. And Satan will try to distract us and get us focused on other things that we miss out on the main thing as to what he wants in our life. He tries to cause us to be distracted from what he wants. That's why it says in, in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13, you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you're wholehearted, not half-hearted in your commitment to seek after me. And then if those things doesn't work, let me just tell you, Satan will try discouragement. And let me just tell you, he's already tried to do that when it comes to our Ten Crusade. I've shared with several of you, I don't think I've shared it on a Sunday morning, that about a month ago, I called to check on our reservation of the tent and when it was going to be here and I received word what reservation <laughs> that really happened and I went what do you mean what reservation I said we've had this tentatively on the calendar since November in March we committed to have Jeremy come it should have been on and they said well somehow it's not listed and it's already booked to be out and so we don't have either the big tent or the small tent available for you. Can I just tell you, my heart sank and I thought, okay, yes. I guess we're just going to end up having a revival type meeting with Brother Jeremy coming. And the more I thought about it, the more I prayed on it, I said, you know what? Lord, that's not what we planned for. That's not what we prayed for. And, and so I went and I, I looked around and I find the, found the best price for a tent that I could and I committed to say we're going to do it. And I hadn't even talked to the deacons. I haven't even talked to you as a church. It's going to cost us a certain amount of money. 
But I said, you know what? This is what we need to be doing. And guess what? Within three days of me working those details out, I got a call from our state convention. And they said, we apologize for the mix-up. And uh, we're not sure how that happened, but we want to pay for your tent. So just give us the bill, and we'll pay for the tent. Sonny Tucker got involved in this. It went all the way up the chain to Sonny Tucker. And Sonny Tucker said, you are not doing this just to minister to your church. You're doing this to minister to your community, and we want to help you do that. And we will support that and we will help do it. And then what was amazing is by ordering the tent and having somebody deliver it, they will come set it up and they will take it down. I can just tell you, Satan will do everything he can to try to destroy discourages. I think of what Nehemiah experienced in Nehemiah chapter 4. He had people and circumstances trying to pull him down and, and he says, no, I can't do that. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. And I can just tell you, Satan will try to distract us and he will try to discourage us and he will try to get us to doubt and he will try to cause division. Let me just tell you there's one more thing. And this is the way that I believe Satan works more than any other in America today. And that has to do with doctrine. That has to do with doctrine. I believe that's his main strategy in our day where we live. He doesn't outwardly work in visible ways the, as He manifests Himself around the world in some third world situations. But I think of what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. He said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I can just tell you, we live in a day when there are a myriad of false doctrines that are circulating. That's one of His main weapons today. Now can I tell you what doctrine of the devil that circulates in the church today that disturbs me the most, even within the Baptist church? It's this. It's when people will say, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That's all that really matters. I was in South Arkansas. I knew this pastor. I heard him say it. I was told he said it from the pulpit. You will never hear me say this. He would say, as long as I can get my big toe in the door of heaven, I'm good. And I just went, you've got to be kidding. You know what? It's more than you and I simply professing a faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Profession has got to be backed up to a real commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord in our life. He doesn't just come to be our Savior. He comes to be our Lord. That means that when we commit our life to Him, we are no longer living for ourselves, but we're called to die to self. And we're called to live for Him. Let me tell you, being saved is just the beginning of what God wants to do in your life and my life. Now let me tell you, it ought to be obvious if you've truly been saved. The Bible says that any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things become new. That means I have new desires, new interests. I have a new love for Jesus. I have a new love for God's people. Now so that you don't forget my main point, as we say, God, we want to see You work and we want to see You move in a greater way than He ever has before. 
expect there to be some opposition. <laughs> expect Him to work in all of those ways and even more. Now all that was introduction. Let's get to the message. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12. If you'll stand with me in honor of God's Word, we're going to read verse 1 through 12 and then come back to verse 11 in particular. Or verse 7 through 12, excuse me. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, that is the devil. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil. And Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And he heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers. Our brothers and sisters has now been thrown down. Who accuses them day and night before our God. Notice verse 11. And they have overcome, they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell with them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Heavenly Father, we come to You again today and we thank You. We thank You that in Jesus Christ we have victory. We thank You that through Jesus shed blood on the cross, God, You provided a way for us to know what it is to be made right with You. God, we have a whole new identity as Your children. And thank You, God. Thank You. That there are many here who have confessed You as Lord and Savior in their life and they've really meant it. But Lord, I pray especially for those today perhaps who've never really settled that. I pray today You would take Your Word and speak it to their heart. God, I pray today You would help us to prepare for the battle. To prepare in these days for what You want to do in a spiritual way. Not only in our lives, in our families, and in this church, but in this community. God, equip us and help us this day. Lord, I pray and I ask that in Jesus' name. As you're seated, let me just share with you, and I'm going to be pretty brief. We're observing the Lord's Supper today. I may come back at some point in the future and preach more fully from some of this, but, but let me just share with you. Verse 11 says, They overcame Him. Three things. By the blood of Jesus. By the word of their testimony. That they love not their life and the death. The first on the path to victory is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that is the most powerful substance in the history of the world. In the words of the song, it breaks the power of canceled sin. It sets the captives free. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that provides the remission, the forgiveness of sin. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus cleanses, I love this, from all sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. The blood of Jesus can cleanse from all sin. It reclaims us from the devil. 
It says we have redemption through His blood. We have been bought back, if you would, from Satan's bondage through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been delivered from the domain of darkness and brought into God's kingdom of light. It's through the blood that we're justified. Having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him, through Jesus Christ. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 9. And then even as we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper today, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 28, Jesus initiates the suppers and He tells them that it represents the covenant, the new covenant made possible through His blood. And what is that new covenant? It means that we have been delivered from the covenant of the law. That's Old Testament. In fact, the word testament means covenant. That's what it is. We've been delivered from the old. We're under the new covenant. And it's a covenant of mercy and grace. Praise God. That is made possible through His shed blood. How do we overcome Satan? It's through the blood of the Lamb. That's what spells His defeat. And then secondly, we overcome through the clear word of our testimony. Through the clear word of our testimony. You know what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32? It says, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But it doesn't stop there. It says, But whosoever will deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father and the angels in heaven. It's important. Not just that we say the words. What's important is the condition of our heart. That it's a commitment that we have made from our heart. It's not, I have committed my life to Christ and I'm a child of God. It's not a matter of, I hope so. It's a matter of, I know so. I confess that confidently. Let me tell you, not only do we confess our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we confess the new identity we have in Christ. How many of you went to go see the Overcomer movie? Alright. I tell you, we did that as a group. And uh, we had over 127 uh, that were able to go and to be a part of that. If you missed it, let me encourage you to go see it. But the whole premise, the whole basis of that movie was that in Jesus Christ we have a new identity. Let me just tell you, one of the most powerful scenes is when that young lady, that young junior hire, really, maybe high school, she stands up and she identifies herself as someone who has been redeemed. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am a child of God. Let me tell you, we need to confess who we are. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We are servants of the Most High God. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us and died for us. We are spiritual warriors. We are members of His body. We are heaven-bound saints. I'm going to tell you, we need to be willing to confess who we are. I mean, how do they overcome? By the blood of the Lamb. By the confession of their mouth. And then number three, by the settled commitment of our heart. It says they love not their life unto death. One of the things we do as a church, we try to do it every month, is we pray for the persecuted church. You know, I shared with you about three weeks ago about how every day in China, God is moving and there are 50,000 people saved a day in China. 
The Spirit of God is moving and working. But can I just tell you something? China is one of those people where people regularly are in prison for their faith. And they willingly die for their faith in Jesus Christ. It's more than just words. It's commitment. The commitment of our heart. I think of how the Apostle Paul put it. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. I have made a commitment that I am going to live for Him. There's another passage that I come to when it comes to dealing with the devil. And it's James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And before it says that you and I ought to resist the devil, the very first word in James chapter 4, verse 7 is submit. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let me just tell you, that's what commitment is. A settled commitment means I have submitted my life, everything I am, everything I have. It's no longer about me. It's about you. And then he says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. And he says, wash your hands, you sin. Cleanse your hearts. You <laughs> need to prepare for these days to see the Lord. We need to submit our lives to Him. We need to know that we have put our faith and our trust in His shed blood. As we're about to observe the supper today, let me just tell you, that's not for everybody. That's for those who committed their life to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because your participation is a testimony. That cup is going to represent the blood of Christ. And as you partake of that, you're saying, I have fully trusted in the blood of Jesus to forgive me of my sin. That little piece of bread represents His broken body on the cross. And I understand it was through His death I've been delivered. I've been saved. It represents your commitment to Christ. Your commitment to say, I want to live no longer for myself, but for Him who died for me. In these days, there are some of you that even as you came into the sanctuary today, the battle's been going on there. It seems like Satan has been just right on top of you. Discouraging you. Stirring up doubt. Seeking to cause conflict. Division. There's some of you that bought into that false doctrine that says, well, I trusted in Jesus way back when and that means I'm right with God forever. It doesn't matter how I live. Let me tell you, if you committed your life to Jesus Christ, it ought to be heaven in your life. And today, maybe you need to trust Christ. Or maybe today, you need to renew your commitment to Him. The Bible says, before you partake of the supper, let each man examine himself. I just tell you, I'm not here to examine your heart. But at this moment, God is. And He sees your heart. He knows where you stand. There's some of you here, you need to trust Him. There's some of you here today, even before we get into revival, you need to begin to prepare your heart for what He wants to do by renewing your commitment to Him. Maybe today, you need to move forward afresh. Maybe today you just need to come to the altar. Would you stand with me as we pray?
Heavenly Father, today again I come and I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that your word would pierce our heart. We recognize Satan would like to snatch the seed of your word away, but I pray right now you would take the seed of your word and drive it deep into our heart. That it can be producing fruit in our lives that's going to remain. Father, we pray for those who've never really settled their commitment to you. Lord, let this be your day. There's some who made commitments, but God, they need to renew that commitment today. There's some that need to move forward in obedience to what you want in their lives. There's some perhaps that just need to come to the altar and get some things right. Or maybe they need to get some things right with a brother or sister. God, as you speak to our heart, God, help us to respond in obedience. Lord, we pray we ask that in Jesus' name.